D. Eve Cordigalair, my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. On the 14th of December 1918, voters across Britain and Ireland went to the polls and voted for a post-war government. In Britain, the election cemented the Conservative Party as the dominant power in Westminster, but in Ireland it had much more dramatic effects. Sinn Féin had contested the election on a pledge to abstain from Westminster and proclaim an independent Irish Republic, and even before the votes were counted on the 28th, it was clear that they had garnered strong nationwide support. The final results would give them 73 of the 105 seats on the island of Ireland. Outside the Unionist areas, primarily in the northeast of the country, the contest was a battle between Sinn Féin and the Irish Parliamentary Party. This straightforward vote on the national question was facilitated by the withdrawal of the Irish Labour Party from the election. The accepted narrative is that Labour stepped aside to allow the election act effectively as a referendum on independence, but that isn't the full reason, and in this episode I'm going to look at that decision by Labour to withdraw. The Labour movement had always been suspicious of, and outrightly hostile to, Sinn Féin after Arthur Griffith denounced striking workers during the 1913 lockout. He was described by Labour in July of 1917 as a sheer reactionary, a pure capitalist man. A Labour pamphlet said, The Irish Republic the Sinn Féiners are after is but the counterpart of France and America, where year after year the capitalist sweats dividends out of his helpless workers. Labour regarded Sinn Féin as representing industrial capitalist interests revolting against a government of landlords. The noted socialist playwright Sean O'Casey was frank in saying, Labour will have to fight Sinn Féin. Throughout 1917, though, things began to change quickly, and Labour had to move with them or risk being left behind. In the aftermath of Count George Plunkett's by-election victory in Roscommon in January, a four-man national committee was created representing the four main strands of radical nationalism. It included William O'Brien, representing Labour, Arthur Griffith, representing Sinn Féin, Cahill Brewer, representing the Irish Volunteers, and Count George Plunkett, representing... himself. Plunkett had not contested the by-election for Sinn Féin, he only agreed to abstain from Westminster after he was elected, and had plans of establishing his own political party. Until the election of a Sinn Féin national executive in October, this committee nominated candidates for the by-elections throughout the year. Sinn Féin received the majority of the credit for the actions of this committee, and would absorb most of the other organisations involved, such as Plunkett's Liberty League. Labour withdrew from the committee at some stage to prevent the same thing from happening to them, but not without some losses, the most notable being Countess Markievicz. An officer in the Citizen Army in the 1916 Rising, she and others felt that the cause of the worker could be best served after the establishment of an Irish Republic through Sinn Féin. Although they played a massive role in the conscription crisis in 1918, staging a one-day strike which crippled transport and munitions production throughout most of the country, Labour was again at risk of losing its independent identity as Sinn Féin was able to reap most of the rewards through its perceived leadership. US entry into the First World War brought the Allies much-needed manpower, but there was no promise of an end in sight to the fighting. It had been almost eight years since the last general election in December of 1910, the Parliament had been extended by emergency legislation, and a decision was taken to hold an election, war or not, by the end of the year. On the 6th of September, the National Executive of the Irish Labour Party met and declared that it was in favour of entering the field at the coming general election, with a number of Labour candidates fighting as an independent political party. It committed to the idea of abstaining from Westminster, for the moment, but envisaged that a time might come or changes might be made that would best allow them to achieve their objectives from within the Parliament. In hindsight, this ambivalent attitude towards abstention would be their downfall. Calls were put out to trade unions to nominate candidates, and meetings were held in Dublin with the aim of contesting at least four constituencies, Dublin Harbour, College Green, St. Patrick's and St. Mickens. Amongst the names suggested for potential candidates was Jim Larkin. Problems started to spring up around the rest of the country, however. In Meath, the Labour Union decided against nominating a candidate at all. A number of trade unions refused to nominate candidates unless there was a firm commitment to abstaining from Westminster, and others said to run in the election against Sinn Féin would be a disservice to the movement and the country. With news that Labour was considering contesting the election, Sinn Féin held off ratifying nominations in Dublin. Harry Boland was sent to discuss matters with Labour, and on the 22nd of September, he and Richard Brennan met with Cahill O'Shannon, 
Thomas Farron, and William O'Brien. Boland reported back that Labour wanted the constituencies mentioned earlier, but that they would take St James's instead of St Patrick's. While saying they intended to contest 15 seats, Boland found 6 to 8 to be more likely, 4 in Dublin, 1 in Cork and Derry, and possibly 1 in Limerick, Waterford and North Sligo. Sinn Féin was facing internal dissent at the idea that candidates in these Dublin constituencies might be ordered to stand down to allow Labour contest them. But Labour was also suffering internal upheaval that threatened to split the organisation. Some trade unions declared that they would support a Sinn Féin candidate over a Labour one in the election. Others opposed the party's refusal to commit to abstention. It also became known that the National Executive, which claimed the decision to contest the election was a unanimous one, had actually been, and still was, heavily split on the matter. Internal unrest was used by some for their own reasons, in particular P.T. Daly. Daly had been ejected from the Irish Republican Brotherhood in 1910 for attempting to take control of the organisation. He then helped James Connolly to found the Irish Labour Party and the Irish Citizen Army, and in 1914 he was suggested by Jim Larkin as Secretary of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. Splits with Connolly and William O'Brien became evident at this time though, the latter describing Daly as incompetent, and Connolly was able to secure the secretaryship for himself. O'Brien took over after Connolly's execution and became one of the most dominant figures in the Irish labour movement for decades to come. Daly used the crisis to strike back at O'Brien and put forward a much-supported alternative, that Labour should withdraw from the election and instead contest in force the municipal elections which could be expected in the new year. James Connolly had accused him of being more liked by nationalists than those in Labour and it's possible that he was using his former IRB contacts to pass information to Harry Boland, Sinn Féin's temporary chief election agent and main negotiator with Labour. At a special trade unions congress on the 1st of November, a vote to withdraw all Labour candidates from the election was passed 96 to 23. The main reason given was that when the decision to contest had been taken, it looked like it would be a war election. With the Axis front collapsing, it would now be a peacetime election, and Labour would withdraw to allow a straightforward vote on self-determination. This was genuine, but also influenced by the fact that contesting the election would have greatly weakened the party. By withdrawing, they maintained unity, but it was a fickle unity, as the party could not depend on its own members to vote for party candidates. Sinn Féin was willing to negotiate an election pact with the Irish Parliamentary Party, and if they had committed to abstaining from Westminster, Labour could have gotten four seats in Dublin without a contest. Standing in the election may have allowed them to put forward a clear socialist agenda, and although the party would have lost a substantial portion of its membership, those remaining would have been committed to that agenda. The decision not to contest is often seen as the reason Irish politics does not split along a left-right divide, but instead along the Civil War divide in Sinn Féin. 100 years on, and with Fianna Fáil backing up a Fine Gael minority government, are we ripe for a change, or did Labour and the left lose forever its chance to be a dominant power in Irish politics? If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like. There will be more in the month ahead as we face into the centenary of the opening of Dáil Éireann and the start of the War of Independence. If you're interested in following the course of the Irish Revolution 100 years on, please subscribe to this channel and follow The Irish Nation Lives on Twitter. Social media links are in the description. Ahorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slongafol.